So welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we start with a completely new topic, neural networks. However, as you will see, it doesn't look so completely new. It looks very much like linear regression, actually. And um, that will be the basis of the neural networks. We could have also called this chapter deep learning. However, I called it neural networks more for classical reasons. However, this is deep learning, yeah? But one can make a whole lecture on the topic as well. Um, so we looked at many things. Um, let's forget about the overview. Let's get started right away. I'm following the following book. Um, there's a really nice book, Neural Networks for Pattern Recognition, from Chris Bishop. Um, and I'm basically following chapter three and four. And this is an old-fashioned introduction to the topic which I like a lot because it's really going into the basics and into the lower level at the beginning and keeping everything super simple. So and once you understand the basic principles behind neural networks, the rest is just making it more complicated, making it bigger, making it deeper, and then you have deep learning. But the basic ideas are, I think, all in chapter three and four of this book. By the way, this is um, one book from Chris Bishop. There's another one. Um, I forgot what the name is, machine learning pattern recognition maybe, something like this. Um, so there's the second one from Chris Bishop, which is a quite famous and successful textbook for machine learning, which is also a super useful book. But I'm not sure whether it's freely available. I think this is also not freely, av freely available. Um, maybe there are some preprints from these chapters. Okay, so let's start right away. We start with single layer networks, okay? so. We look at the following problem. We have a two-category classification problem, or a two-class ca classification problem, OK? Now this new wording just um, is there because I'm following the book, and they call it two-category classification problem. But it's the same as before. And we consider a so-called linear discriminant function. So basically, we are doing linear regression, kind of, OK? So we have some input vector x. We multiply it with some weight vector, sum everything up, so that's this inner product plus some constant term, which is often also called the threshold, or it's sometimes called the bias. Okay? And then we say if this expression or this value is greater than zero, we say we are in one class, and otherwise we are in the second class. So let's draw a simple picture for that one. So we really have just two classes, so here's one class. And here's another class. And by saying I'm having a linear discriminant, basically we are looking for a straight line between those two. Where now, here I'm having some orthogonal vector, right, which is orthogonal to the separating hyperplane or the separating line. OK, so this is my w, basically. And then by projecting all the data, projecting it onto this one with the inner product, I'm basically projecting everyone onto this new coordinate axis down here. And then I can decide with my threshold. So this gives me a plus w0, maybe. And then I can move it around how I like to do it. Okay? And by changing the w, I'm changing the plane. And by changing the w0, I'm kind of changing the threshold, yeah, where I say, so there's class 1. And then there might be class 2. Sometimes class 2 is also called class 0. Sometimes class 0 is also called class minus 1. Yeah? But that doesn't matter. Yeah? So that's just the name. And sometimes it's nicer for the formula to have one or the other. OK, so far so simple. That's good. Um, this is our first neural network. So now where's the network here? So let's write it, write it down again. So. Um, Let's again say, so we have y of x being equal w transpose x plus some w0. So where is here the neural network? For that, we, we need to draw basically a little graph that explains the computation behind this one. Okay? So suppose my x is um, some three-dimensional vector, for example. Okay? So this is from r to the 3. I could write these inputs as nodes in a graph. So here's my graph. And I want to have a graph which explains this computation here. 
Okay? So, what's my first operation? I multiply it with some weights and then I get a result. Okay, so I will get a result W transpose X and basically those are the contributing links. And I will put the weights onto these links. So now this is looking now a little bit more like a network, right? Basically what I did, I translate this computation into a graph. Okay, and so the graph is then telling me what is computed. And then there's the final step that I'm also adding the W0. And this could be seen like saying, okay, I'm always having like a constant one down here. So I have always the last coordinate. Or let's make it the first coordinate, okay? So here's the first coordinate. And that one is constant one, and that is also connected with some weight W0. Okay, and by that I have my first neural network. At the end, of course, now I could say, okay, here's another function that I use. I'm using the sine function, yeah, where the sine function is defined sine of x is either equal to 1 or minus 1, depending on I'm greater or smaller than 0. Okay, it's just giving me the Vorzeichen, the sign. And then I'm having the output, so that would be then the let's say now I would call it the class, right, since this is already the array of x. And this is our first neural network. That's it. And now everything, deep learning, transformer, blah, 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 everything that's out there is a more complicated version of that one, okay? So now, why is that interesting? Um, yeah, so why is it called neural network, right? So that might be an interesting question. So where's the neurons here? The neurons are, so here we have some other dendroids from some other, and I, I, this I call the synapses, right? They are connected with some um, axon. I forgot the name. Is this thing the axon? Maybe. So this is the cell body of your neuron, okay? And it's getting information from many inputs, and they are integrated. Yeah, integration sounds so fancy, but integration is just summation, so they are summed up. So you get lots of electrical currents from other neurons. In this case, it's just the input. And they go and build up, and once they have, have some action potential, I, I'm using the wrong word, so don't count on this one. So if here's, I'm over a certain threshold, then this thing will fire and say, yes, it's this class or the other class. So it's kind of looking like a neuron. And you could imagine now taking the output here and plugging it into the next one and so on and so forth. And we can build the whole brain, let's say, of a fly. Okay. Of the human brain, that's getting more and more complicated. But maybe this is like a little mathematical model of a, of a neuron that we have in animals and in, in humans. That's why it's called a neural network. Okay. And, um, let me write it down. So this is a neural net or a neural network. And I want to have it once in German as well. So there are different options. Some people say neurales netzwerk or neurales net, but I don't like that and I've never heard it. I've only heard it from, from people where I don't believe that they know. So in, in German, I would call this neuronales netz. Or Netzwerk. So it's neuronales net. It's not a neurales net, but a neuronales net. But those are just words. So I'm fine if you're in an exam, in an oral exam with me, and you say, yes, let's use a neuro neurales net. And I say, great, great idea. Okay, write down the equation. And everything is okay. So don't worry too much about it. But I think this is the right word. And this can't be made into a German one. Okay, so this is not very network, but you could imagine to make it easily more complicated. So, in a way, we are just doing linear discriminant analysis. This is just statistics, right? However, when you look at the mathematics here and you draw a nice picture, suddenly you get a neuron like in biology, right? So this is like very inspiring. So people started, man, maybe we can build the human brain. Maybe we can understand it. Maybe we can have AI with it. And... Um, we will see like the, some of the proponents from the 60s 
who were working on this. And the whole direction was called the Connectionist Movement. Okay? And there's still the Connectionist mailing list where you can subscribe and people like Geoffrey Hinton or Jan Lecun, sometimes they write something to the Connectionist mailing list. So it's still active, or Jürgen Schmidhuber. Um, and so there were like two different branches in AI in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and so on and so forth. But like they started in the 60s, there were some people who were thinking, yes, we get AI by using a neuronalist network, by using neural networks. So we need to rebuild the brain, how it looks, and then we get AI. And then there were the others, they were more coming from mathematics, and they were saying, no, we use logic. We, we try to formalize mathematical logic. And you know, there are still a big branch in AI called knowledge representation and reasoning. And there we just had got a new nice professorship on this one from Jean Jung, I think, who just started. He will um, offer great lectures on this more logical aspect. And um, that's the other side. So that's more the logical AI community. And they are competing. And during the lecture, we will see how they really compete, one writing a book against the other and so on and so forth. And we see a little bit of that. Um, for example, one argument against this is, Yes, yeah, this looks like a neuron, but when you look at animals, how they fly, they flap their wings, but when you see our planes, they don't. So sometimes there's a better solution, right, once you understand the principle. And so if you understand the principle of intelligence, maybe from a mathematical perspective, maybe we don't need to flap our wings, right, and so we shouldn't be so biologistic about these learning things. You could also imagine, so there's the mathematics, people who like, of course, logical AI. So what branch of people do like these kind of things? So do you have any suggestions? What branch of science might be, find this super intuitive to think about it? Any suggestions? Hmm? Biologists, for example. And let's move more to the engineers. So what kind of engineers would like this kind of things? So it's from the double E department. Double E is the electrical engineering. They like these things. This is just a circuit, right? So maybe we can have a, a new part here that is kind of integrating currents and building up and then firing again. So we can solder something, and then we can solder some AI system. And we will see in the lecture a picture of that one. OK? So there's typically, I think, the neural networks community, I think is, so that's my personal opinion. But how, what I'm reading, so I think it's more originating from the electrical engineering side. And like the logical, I think, is more coming from the mathematics side. Now we could say, OK, since 2010, like deep learning is everywhere. And deep learning is basically using neural networks to solve any task, even automatic translation, where we thought, yeah, you really have to have some logical understanding for machine translation, for example, to solve it. But even for these kind of things, the neural networks are now super successful. But it has been always an up and down. So these have been successful in some pattern recognition tasks earlier. But then they failed at certain other problems. And similarly, the logical su things were super, ex uh, super successful, for example, in the 80s with expert systems. But then there was a decline again. And right now, we are in another AI summer where lots of money is thrown onto AI research, and companies want to hire you after you've had this lecture here, because you know everything about machine learning. But it's always an up and down. So we don't know what will be in 10 years. However, right now it looks like neural networks are really very successful and they scale very nicely with computation and data. So they are quite nice, right? As you know, in, in logical AI, let's say you want to do automatic theory improving, you basically have a search problem. And typically you have an NP-complete search problem for searching for a proof or searching for a Sudoku solution or searching for whatever you like. So it, the runtime, scales with the problem size um, yeah, um, not very nicely, exponentially, so super more difficult. On the other hand, neural networks, as it turns out, um, and we will see how they are trained, their training scales linearly with the number of training examples. So if you have the double number of training examples, you have the double number time of computation, which is OK, right? You have to look at each example once. So you cannot expect less than like linear scaling with the number of examples. But this is a very nice property. And also with computation, the more computation you have, the bigger problems you can consider. So they have nice scaling behavior. Of course, it also meant like in the 80s or 90s when this book was written from Chris Bishop, there was also um, neural networks already competing 
in pattern recognition competitions. And then beginning, uh, end of the 90s, they were like losing against some, something like support vector machines and these kind of, even though support vector machines had a runtime of n cube or n squared, if you're lucky, right? The performance was much better. Um, however, then came GPUs, like people like to play computer games with great graphics, then researchers found out, okay, these, these stupid computations to put triangles on a screen could be also used for neural networks. So let, let's use them for training. And suddenly you have these massive computing powers. And at the same time, you have the internet, so massive amounts of data. And that was very much in favor of neural networks. So that's why they're working so well right now. Okay? So, great topic. Let's look at the basics. Okay? Let's look at how it works. And the basic is the linear discriminant function. So this is basically like the simplest version of this, okay? So, as I said, or shown on the board, this will create a linear decision boundary, right? Just a straight line. Basically, same classifier as a support vector machine without caring about the margin. So in a way, a little bit more primitive, right? First of all. Um, as I said, the bias term, this plus W0, could be merged into the axis if we assume that the first entry is one, and we can just set it constant to one, and then it gets even simpler, right? In, in a way, we are increasing the dimensionality of the problem, but don't worry too much about it. So we are adding another constant um, dimension to the problem. We can also generalize this to several categories, so several classes. So we could have, for every class, let's say we have 10 classes for the MNIST digits, we could have for each of those, we could learn a weight vector, okay? So we could have a, a separating or a discriminant function for each of the classes, and then we always say, okay, we assign x to class k if the k's line kind of generates the largest number. Okay, so that's another option to get to a multi-class problem. Yeah, but this is also a trivial generalization that is well known from statistics. Um, let's look at the board. So how would it look in a neural network representation now? Um, let's get rid of some of the stuff here. Um, And let's get rid of the sign, okay? So let's simplify it. Um, and then we would say the um, output here, I think axon was wrong, but I don't know. You, you check it out, what a, how a cell looks like. I meant the cell body, where there's some, some um, what is ladung in English? Charge, where some charge is building up. Okay, anyway, so this is my y of x. Now, I, if I have a multi-class problem, then I would say, now, this is y1, okay? And the um, neurons that are involved here, I would call them, um, let me think about it. So let's say this is w10, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3. And so you see where I'm getting at. So we could have another one and another one if we have a three-class problem. And of course, in this case now, I need more arrows. And more weights. And it gets messy quite quickly. So often people then write it. Maybe you've seen pictures like this. So this is, uh, I'm not doing it systematically. So which am I missing? That one. Yeah, so maybe you've seen pictures like that one, where everyone is connected with everyone. However, we have the power of linear algebra, right? So we could also write it very briefly. We could just say, okay, we get a vector x, a y of x, where this is now r to the 3, and this is just w times x. It's just a matrix times x, where I'm omitted now the, the constant term here already. I put it already in. If you don't want to put it in, you could also put like a vector b at the end, like a bias term. So a neural network, or this picture here, is just another way of writing a matrix vector multiplication. OK, that's exactly what it is. So this is an x, this is a y, and the connections are the entries of my matrix w. OK, so that's it. And if you look at some of the presentations, like my crappy picture here, 
and you draw it all out. So this is a, it's, it's nice to think about it like this, but in a way it's a waste of resources because we could just write it as w times x. It's just the simplest operation possible. Okay. Okay, so far so good. And now um, let's look at it more detail. What are we computing now? So suppose we are assigning x to class k. So for all and for all classes that are not k, now the y sub k was the largest one. Okay? We can plug in our weights here, yeah, which are basically the I think those are the rows of W, okay? The WK is the row of W. And um, so I'm having a WK times X, and here I'm having a WJ times X. So I can um, drag out the X, and so I'm getting basically this expression. And okay, I could say greater than zero, or I could say being equal to zero is exactly the boundary. Then I'm seeing that basically we are getting a linear decision between multi multiple classes, okay? And this, again, could be also drawn as a picture, and that's one that you might have seen already. So, um, so there's one linear function like that, and then there's another one like that, and maybe another one like that. And then we say, uh, let's say this is the positive side, this is the negative side, uh, and this might be the positive side. Uh, is this picture good? I'm not sure. So where I want to get to is that basically, let me draw a different picture. I think this is not useful. So I, I basically want to get to this Voronoi cell representation, okay? So this is the area where basically one of the linear function is largest, and this is another area where another linear function is largest, and that is another one. So basically we are chopping the whole space into Voronoi cells with something like that, okay? But um, I think the lines that I've drawn, they are a little bit confusing. So this is the discrimination line between, let's say this is one, two, three, and four, and so if I would take the y, the y4, Ah, okay, minus the y1 of x, then I get this line. Okay, and similarly, this will be the difference between y4 and y3, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a way, to, so what it would be the multi-class thing? So the two-class thing is just a straight line, and with an expert blick, uh, expert view on this one, you see this is also a Voronoi, two Voronoi cells, right? But they are very simple. And if you have more classes, basically the thing looks like that one. Okay, which is also the result of k-means. So that's, that's quite similar. Let me check my battery. Oh, it's still there. So please tell me if this, this thing doesn't move anymore. But maybe that's too distracting for you to look all the time. Maybe we should always have one of you looking at that one. Oh, okay. Just kidding. Okay, you better, better follow to the lecture. I look at it too. Okay, so we see what a multi-category classification problem would look like, what we get out of this. Um, we can make it a little bit more general, and then it's called logistic discriminants. When we move the output here through some nonlinear activation function, uh, or some nonlinear monotonic function, and we did already by saying, let's take the sine, for example, or some other function, right? Um, however, in general, this thing is called an activation function. And the question is, why would we like to do that? So why move our linear decision boundary through a nonlinear function, which nonlinear transforms it, um, in, in particular monotonically? So it, it won't do anything to the classification decision, right? It was, would just maybe... Um, push all the points closer to the bar or further away or something, like, a, like having here a gummy a rubber band and you kind of can stretch it in some fashion. So what's the point of that one? And um, one point will be when we have several layers, and I will have a comment on that one. But the other point is that we want to have a nice interpretation. So um, there are certain choices, such that now the output at the end can be interpreted as, um, let me give you the preview, as a class probability. 
Okay, so I explain all the formulas. What I want to get is we want to have that the output g of a, where the a is now this linear discriminant, is the probability of being in a certain class. Okay, so that's, for example, a nice choice. So let's see how we could get there. So now let's assume that our locations x are sampled from a Gaussian distribution, where we have one Gaussian for the one class and another Gaussian for the other class. Okay, so we have two means, and let's say we have the same covariance matrix. I explained to you already if the covariance matrix of two classes are not the same, we possibly have a nonlinear decision boundary. We only have a linear decision boundary if I'm having the same covariance matrix for both classes, and then. Let's write down the Gaussian distribution. So given that I know I'm, I'm in a certain class, okay, then I have a Gaussian distribution here. And then we can use Bayes' theorem here by um, basically inverting the probability by multiplying this likelihood function now with some class probability, which is for me now just a constant. Okay, so let's see. So the first step here is just applying Bayes' rule, okay, where the bottom is p of x, right, where I'm integrating out the classes, and then I can bring the top part to the um, denominator, right, then I get a 1 in front and I get the quotient in the back, okay, and now if I replace this quotient with e to the minus a, then I have a very typical activation function, the so-called logistic sigmoid, okay, and now you might ask, so why can you write it as an e to the minus a? Um, if you plug in for the a, the logarithm of this quotient, yeah, then basically the minus sign will swap the denominator and the denominator, so I get the right quotient here. Okay, and the exponential and the logarithm will just vanish. So why go through all this pain, like backward, right? Because one can show that the logarithm of this quotient is just a linear function, okay? And um, yeah, maybe one should write it up completely the other way around. I show you the terms. So those are the terms, okay? And if you plug them into the expression on the previous slide, if you, if you plug the w and the w0 that I wrote down here, yeah, you can't do it in your head, I can't do it in my head. If you do it and you plug it in, then you get exactly this quotient here, okay? And maybe I should put it and explain it on the board and let's do it, we have time, why not? Right, uh, okay, let me just copy it and then we see the calculation. And since my explanation was a little bit backward, um, I tried to go through it forward again, okay? Okay, so let's start with these expressions. I copying them on the board and then I switch off the slides, okay? So we have w being equal to sigma to the minus one. And this is the difference of the means. Okay, great. And then there's the w zero, which is minus a half u one transpose sigma to the minus one u1, and then I guess comes the same term again, but with a plus sign, and then comes the logarithm of the quotient, p of c1 and p of c2. Okay, great, so let's forget about that slide, and now the statement is that my a being equal to w transpose x plus w0, that is something useful that can be turned into the logarithm of these four probabilities, okay? So let's try to do that, um, and for that one, how do I do this more cleverly? Okay, let, so let's write down the a. a is equal to w transpose x plus w0, and where do you want to get? I want to get to logarithm of a, uh, logarithm of something complicated, p of x, given c1 times probability of c1 
So that that is the same as this one. Okay. So now let's flip to the board. So so far so good. I just copied stuff. And now what I want to show you is basically this equation. Okay? That that one is equal to the logarithm of this one. And if that's the case, let's look again on the slide and see that then the rest follows. Okay? So um, for that one, let's write out basically the A. So the A is equal to um, now I need this expression up here, and it will be transposed times x, so I can write it out backwards, right? So this is mu1 mu2 transpose times sigma to the minus 1, which is a symmetric matrix. The inverse of a symmetric matrix is also symmetric, so nothing to do here, times the x, and then plus the remaining term, which I'm not copying for now, and now, um, here's the logarithm in here. So um, how do I get that one? I get it just by putting it there and then putting the exponential function. OK, so that is just the identity function. And I can apply now the e function to all of this. So let's do that. And there I have mu i. Oh, is it already? Was it a clever, clever move already? W0 must be positive, right? Ah, OK. Thank you. Like this, right? OK. And maybe I should um, first split the terms, sort them, and then put the logarithm and the exponential there. So maybe I'm a little bit too early here, right? Or am I? Let me just think. No, I think it's fine. It's OK. OK, so I'm having e to the, let's write it out. We have this term, that is mu1 times that one, and then I have minus mu2 transpose sigma to the minus 1x. OK, so far so good. Let's put the other term there as well, and let's sort it a little bit. Uh, there's not so much to sort. OK, let's just keep it as w0. So, and now you see we have something like e to something minus e to something. OK, it's like saying e to now I need a good letter. OK, e to alpha minus beta, which is the same as e to alpha divided by e to beta. OK? So I can take all the terms that have a positive sign, put them somewhere, and I take the one with a negative sign and put them on the other side. And I'm doing it like that, that I want to have this term on the top, so with a minus sign. And I will add a minus sign on this one. OK, so let's do it. So I'm having a logarithm here of a quotient now, where in the quotient now I'm having e to the minus, I think that might be a good idea, minus mu2 transpose sigma to the minus 1 x. OK, that one. And then I'm also taking this one over here, might be a good choice. Ha, and I'm missing, oh, that is a constant term. Where's the square term? I'm missing something. OK, I don't want to cut this video. It should work. <laughs> OK, so um, let's try it. OK, let's put it in here. So that is this term coming from the w0, and I didn't change the sign. And then I put this one down. So I have another x minus mu1, sigma1, x plus a half. So far, so good. And um, so I dealt with this term. And in the w0, there's still the logarithm term here. So I can have um, yet another factor, x of ln of something di divided by something. However, this something divided by something, I just write as 
something divided by something. So I just keep it like this. OK? So it's just a factor. OK, now I promised that this will be a Gaussian distribution somehow, right? So where is the x square? OK, I think I know where the x square is. Any suggestions? Right? What are we missing here to having a Gaussian thing? We need a term that looks like this. Where do we get it? Any ideas? No ideas how to get it? OK, then it's good that I'm doing the derivation. It would have been a nice exercise. Um, the, the nice thing now is this term here is the same for the top part and the bottom part, because the sigma is for both classes the same. So it will appear here and here. And so I can just introduce it. OK? So I can just multiply this expression with anything that I want, at least if I do it on the top and at the bottom. OK, that's just the one. Um, now, almost, I have it almost right now. So I think I should put a 1 half in front of this one as well. And I think I messed up with the signs, right? It's the wrong way around. So I, this thing should go to the top, and this thing should go to the bottom. Because I want to have a minus sign here in front of this one. OK, then I can drag out the 1 half, and then I have just the this formula that you all know, a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Or maybe also with a minus sign. Yeah, you know all this one, maybe. If you don't, now you know it. OK, so let's reshuffle terms. So um, I need to take the logarithm Let's be already happy about the p of c1 and p of c2. Let's put it in front. And next, I need to reorder the terms cleverly. So let's start with the term with this one. But let's put a minus sign in front. OK. Then I have exponential of minus 1 half x transpose z1. OK. Let's drag out the minus 1 half. Um, the next term that we need is this one. But I take the one from the bottom and change the sign. OK, I hope you don't mind. So do I change the sign? Um, yes. Yes, OK, this is now several steps at the same time. I hope you are fine with me. OK, now what happened? What did I do? Uh, let me first finish it. You want this is mixed up anyway, so this must be a one and another one. So and I don't want to write with my fingernails. So let's do the same thing again. And there's no 1 half now. So there's a 2. OK, let's first appreciate the first one. OK, so I guess you're fine with the minus a half x transpose x. We have it here. And we have it down there. So it will cancel out. So that is just the one that we put in the back. Now, how did I get this term at the right location? So I did several steps. I swapped that one because the sigma is symmetric, fine. Then I swapped this term to the top. I did this by changing the minus sign into a plus sign. OK. However, then I dragged out a minus a half from the whole expression. And by dragging out a minus a half out of the expression, I'm getting here a minus 2. So if I put the minus a half back 
in front of this expression, I'm having a plus one. And so this plus one is exactly this term on the top. And I did the same with this term and put it to the bottom. Now, the last one is over here. Um, this mu1 sigma mu1 is moved to the top. So I'm having a mi what, minus a half of this term. And then by dragging out the minus a half, I'm having a plus. Great. So far, so good. Um, now, what is missing? So let's rewrite it. There's still some constant missing, right? This looks almost like a Gaussian distribution now. So this thing here, is there space? Yeah, there is some space. So this term could be written as x minus mu, x minus mu. So it can be written like this. OK. Minus a half, I'm fine also with that one. So what's remaining is, for the Gaussian distribution, I now need to put the right constant here so that everything is great, right? So what is the right constant? I can't remember so easily. So what is you need to correct me? So it will be the uh, something like 1 divided by a determinant square root of that one, right? Determinant of the square, square root. And then we have something like 2 pi. I think to the power of d half, OK? If my Gaussian distribution is d-dimensional, I think it's 2 pi. The good thing is it doesn't matter if I get the constant wrong, because I will write down the same wrong constant down here. And so it's no problem if I made a mistake in this formula here. Yeah? Both mistakes cancel out. Great. Now we have the two Gaussian distributions here. And I can replace it with the probability of x, seeing x, given that I'm in class 1 divided by the probability of x, given that I'm in class 2. Great. And that is exactly what I wanted to prove. OK? Any questions about this derivation? OK, I take this as an I understand everything completely up to the last sign. Very nice. Or um, I don't understand everything, but I think I can figure it out at home. OK, great. So now let's see, what did we show? So we showed that this weird choice that looks very arbitrary, but I think when I wrote this down, it took me a while to figure it out. If you plug it into this linear equation, these weights, we really get the logarithm of this quotient, OK? And the logarithm of the quotient, if we plug it into e to the minus, so now this is the backward or the forward explanation, maybe, yeah? Then we can, the minus sign is swapping nominator and denominator. And then I can drag out one of the terms, and I get the other expression. And then I'm having base rule, and then I'm having the probability of being in class 1 given x, OK? OK, long story short, this is the reason why we look at this weird function 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus a. And this is a so-called sigmoid activation function. And it's like a very famous function, OK? Let's look at it by plotting it, OK? So let's plot it and see what it's doing. Um, so motivated, it's motivated by assuming I'm having two Gaussian classes. However, later, when you maybe do some deep learning yourself, yeah, then you design your neural network with transformer or without, or with some linear and nonlinear layer and whatever. Um, and then you say, oh, I need another activation function. Let's take the sigmoid. And at that moment, you don't think about, oh, there was something about logistic regression and about some Gaussian distributions. You just say, let's try that one, and let's see how, how well it goes. And then it doesn't go well. You say, let's take another one, and you don't care. So it's more like then one of the tools that you can use, but um, y is not so relevant anymore for you. But this is basically the reason why it exists. OK, let's, tr let's try to plot it. So um, 
Okay, so let's say this is a, and um, then this will be 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus a. Okay, interesting. So let's see. So for a going to infinity, yeah, e to the minus a, yeah, so let's re remember what, how the e function looks like. So the e function looks like this, and it's crossing right at the 1 here. Okay, and it's nicely going here closer and closer to this axis. And here it's going very rapidly, faster than any polynomial it's going to infinity. So for a going to plus infinity, e to the minus a is going to minus infinity, so it's going to 0. OK? So if, if this goes to 0, I have 1 divided by 1. So I will go somewhere against the 1. OK? So that is kind of the asymptotic behavior here. So what about? a is going to minus infinity, then e to the minus minus infinity is e to infinity. e to infinity is super large. Super large is like infinity. 1 divided by infinity is 0. Okay, So the other asymptotics is z1. And then e function is infinitely many differentiable and blah, 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 having nice properties. Let's see what's happening at 0. So e to the 0 is 1, so it will be 1 half. And now that means, so somehow we need to converge against that one and against that one, and we will have a nice looking, well behaved function. Then the only solution looks like this. Okay, otherwise it would be super surprising if it would be to do something like this in between, right? Why, right? It won't do it. So this is the function. Okay, so what does this function do? It basically takes the interval. So this function 1 divided by e blah, blah, blah. So this function, let's, or we call it g. g of a, what does it do? It basically maps the, the interval. OK, let's write the open interval from minus infinity to plus infinity. Yeah, I think some people also like to write it like this. Is it the same? Oh, I don't know. I forgot onto the open interval from 0 to 1. OK? So it's kind of compressing the whole thing. Similar like in a neuron in a brain, right? There come lots of currents come in, and maybe the whole thing is overflowing, and then it's firing with some defined signal, not with infinity or something, but just with one defined signal. So we are kind of integrating the information. It doesn't matter how large we were at minus infinity or at plus infinity. After that, we are again between 0 and 1. So it's kind of like normalizing the stuff that's going on. By the way, where was this thing coming from? It was coming from base rules. So it should be a probability, right? Ah, OK. So we could have used that knowledge already, right? Since it is a probability anyway, it should be between 0 and 1. right? Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Now, of course, if your data points are from two Gaussians, yeah, then this will be the posterior distribution. If your data points look like two bananas, yeah, then this posterior distribution does not give you the, uh, then this is not the posterior distribution because the assumptions were wrong. However, nonetheless, it might work. Okay, great. So we learned something about the sigmoidal function, right? Um, of course, now we could ask, so for this simple setup, are there any limitations? Yeah, for example, in 2D, and you're already nodding, so what is the limitation? Um, like yes, exactly. Wow. You looked at the slides before. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, no, no, it's commonly known. So this is like, no, it's, it's maybe in other countries you learn it already earlier, in kindergarten or somewhere. But um, so you learn it now here in Germany. So this is the XOR problem cannot be solved. Okay. So let me explain you the XOR problem for everyone who doesn't know it. So the XOR problem is the following nice problem. I'm not sure now. I'm making up the story. Now I'm a logical AI person, right? And I'm saying, ah, yeah, okay, brain is nice, and yeah, base is nice. But here's a problem you can't solve. Okay. And the problem looks like this. What if one class has two clusters? and the other one has also two clusters, then your neuron can't do it anymore, right? Try to draw a line that separates the classes, right? It's not possible, right? 
Um, that's bad, right? That's at least very bad publicity for your method, right? And you, you should come up with, with some, some solution. Um, the deeper insight here, this is related to the vapnik chervonenkis dimension of linear classifiers, something we haven't talked about. But there will be a lecture on statistical learning theory as well. Yeah? And there we talk about the VC dimension very briefly. It's a very different point of view at looking at machine learning, very mathematical. And so we will look at, at this to get to the VC dimension so that you get an intuition for this. And basically now it's saying a linear classifier in two dimensions has a VC dimension three, whatever that is, but it means it is restricted in what it can do. And of course, if you have a nonlinear classifier, it could have a much higher VC dimension and by that being more powerful. For example, suppose now I could draw some, some nonlinear things like an hyperbola or something, then I would have a perfectly um, splitting thing here, right? So, or we could also square everything and then basically we can suddenly linearly discriminate it like in um, linear regression. And from the perspective of statistical learning, see, having a small VC damage is not a bad thing, but it's something that regularizes the problem. So you are not overfitting to the data. However, typically for every function class yeah, that is useful, there will be some restrictions. And for the linear classifier, the XOR problem is a restriction. But that is not a bad thing in general. Um, of course, we would like to make it more powerful. How can we make it more powerful? We make it more powerful by using just the same idea as in linear discriminant analysis. We put some basis functions here, OK? So um, again, for the threshold, we need to fix some zeros index to be 1. But then with the other ones, we can go crazy and have any features that we want. For example, for the XOR problem, yeah, if um, that is first coordinate and that is the second coordinate, or maybe I should put them up here, the indices. I don't know. Maybe that's better. Uh, not really. So let's say those are the coordinates. So what could we do? We could also go into some feature space, right, and doing something fancy. So here's a very simple transformation. I think we can just multiply the two numbers, and that's already quite clever. So we could go from the r to the 2 into the r to the 1. We're multiplying the numbers, OK? And then let's say those are around 1. So they are plus 1, plus 1. Those are around minus 1, minus 1. So if I multiply this coordinate with that coordinate, I get a positive number, that coordinate with that one. So my plus signs, they will all end up somewhere over there, OK? So far, so good. In my minus signs, they have one coordinate positive, the other one negative. So if I do that, I'm ending up over here. And now in r to the 1, the hyperplane is basically just the threshold. And we can easily classify it, OK? However, of course, um, the trick will be that we replace these basis functions with neural networks as well. And then we are getting towards deep, deeper and deeper learning. Now, in principle, now we could say we have a predefined basis function. And then we can solve much more complicated problems. Are there any limitations to that one? There is a theory. Maybe I should include it into the lecture. That one can show that any for a suitable choice of basis functions, yeah, any continuous function can be arbitrarily well approximated if I let m go large enough. Yeah, one choice of basis functions could be, for example, the, these Fourier functions, cosine and sine. So if you use those, for example, then by knowing that with the Fourier transform you can arbitrarily approximate a function, then you could use it here as basis functions. But there are many more. OK? And now we can suddenly solve the XOR problem. And here's my feature function that I just showed you on the, on the board, which is just multiplying the two coordinates. OK? So far, so good. Great. Um, let's see how we now can learn neural networks. Yeah? Let's see how we can learn the weights. That's the idea of machine learning, right? And that's also the idea of the neural networks. Of course, you could also say, um, I'm soldering my, my electric circuit, which is doing these computations that I showed you on the, on the board. And then I have these turning knobs, like a big mixing table, like in an audio studio or something. And you are setting the weights until it works. But of course, it's nicer if you can do it automatically. And 
Also, that is easy to do. Um, like in, in linear regression, we had a closed form solution, but there's also another way we can also use some mathematical optimization for that. So let's see. And the notation here is basically different from what we've seen before, but the idea is exactly the same. And the notation is from the Bishop book. That's why it might look a little bit strange. So here now the training points are having a super index, and that is basically numer enumerating them, enumerating them. And so we have the target. So this is the target of the nth data point. And the target of the nth data point has, let's say, 10 entries. C equals 10, OK, where I have a 1 if I'm in the particular class and I have a 0 otherwise. ARCA one hot encoding, OK, which where one hot encoding, I think, is a word that is only 10 years old or something. But this is like a very nice description of what's going on. So one is 1, and the other ones are 0. You could also view it like a probability distribution. So the probability of being in class 7 is 1, and for the other ones, it's 0. And then we just use the least squares technique now to minimize the problem. So we have the output of our neural network, which is the y of x. And then we compare it basically with the target values. And we say, let's take the least square of that one and minimize this function. OK, and that's like the simplest way to do. Now, of course, I hope the words least squares or sum of squares is already triggering a question in your head. So why least squares? Why can we do this? Where's the Gaussian distribution? And here, there is really no Gaussian distribution, right? So here, we are really just comparing some output yeah, that has been some linear mapping, maybe with some nonlinearity. And we compare it with some vector where there's a 1 in there. And we say, let's take a nice, smooth, differentiable function, which doesn't have any edges. And so we just take it to the power of 2. But there's no deeper reason here. However, in deep learning, then what people typically are using is they say, OK, the t to the power of n is a probability distribution. Um, I want to have these also to be a probability distribution. And let's take the KL divergence between those probability distributions. And then you get a loss function like the so-called cross entropy loss, where the cross entropy loss is calculating exactly the KL divergence between the one hot encoding and the output of the classifier. And that one typically makes more sense. However, for these simple examples, it's fine. And it's first OK to say, let's take a least square error here. We can calculate the derivative of that one with respect to w. And here I'm using the notation from the book, just a partial derivative with respect to the weight kj, yeah, where the weight kj is really a scalar. Yeah, it's one of the entries of the big matrix. And calculating the derivative of the e, this error function, basically it commutes with all the sums. And then you have a squared function here. Okay, So the squared function basically meaning the derivative of x squared is 2x. Right? So the 2 disappears against the 1 half, and the x is just this expression, the one that has been chosen. So it's just this is the x, basically. You just repeat it, but not to the power of something, times the inner derivative. And the inner derivative of this summation here, right, for w, k, j, is only the kth term, where k is equal to j, OK? Or not where k is equal to j. It is, um, oh, what is this one? No, no, it's the one where I'm basically picking out the right row. So it's only, I'm only picking out the sum end basically where the wkj appears. And that is the one with the phi j. So that's where I'm getting the phi j. So this is the derivative of the inner function. And the front part here is the derivative of the outer function. OK, it's just a chain rule. And this can be rewritten. Um, also nicely by saying I having these residuals, where the residuals could be positive or negative, and then I'm basically summing up over all residuals times the activations of these basis functions. And now you could think about also whether it makes sense or not. So let's say um, re the residual is quite large, right? Meaning there's a big mismatch between the true distribution and the one that got computed. Okay, if it's very large. It means there will be a large change also in my weight, right? Because I'm using the gradient now to modify my weight with using gradient descent. The other thing is, if there's one of the activations among the j equals 1 to m, 
which was very large, that had a very large reason for being getting the wrong result. So that thing should get penalized a lot, right? So the derivative is large for these entries where we had large basis activations and where we had a large error, okay? And so this kind of intuitively also works. Now, how do we use this gradient? Um, so we could consider the derivative for a single location, for example. Yeah, this is just for a single data point and not for all of them. And then we could do so-called stochastic gradient descent. So that is the uh, that is the method for deep learning to optimize the weights. So how does it work? We have a for loop over all data points, and then after each, I take a single data point, and I calculate the gradient for that data point, and I update the weights. And then I take the next data point, I calculate the gradient for that one, and update the weights. Um, and updating it just means I'm changing it with minus some learning rate, and then comes the gradient, okay? So gradient descent means descending, so making something smaller. Gradient ascent would mean making something larger. And so how do you um, decrease a function? Or if you are hiking in, in the Alps and you want to get downhill, so you get, want to get smaller, so if you go downhill, you go against the gradient because the gradient is always pointing to the top. Okay, so you go against the gradient, so you say minus the gradient, okay? So that is a very common method. However, there's another one, the batch gradient method. And to really appreciate the stochastic gradient method, let's understand the batch gradient, okay? So for the batch gradient, we don't take a single data point, but we're calculating the overall gradient of everyone, yeah? So in principle, we want to minimize the overall error for all data points, which can be written as a sum over all these single errors, okay? That means if I have the gradient for all these single errors, I can just average these gradients to get a gradient overall. And I'm doing a step towards that direction. And then I will really minimize my function E. That is in contrast to the stochastic gradient method where I'm taking a single data point. So the thing is, the reason why this might be a good idea, let me try to show you on the board. And in this case now, um, we have uh, the function is the squared function of my parameters w, right? So it will be some um, polynomial. So this is basically my function e of w, right, in terms of the parameters where I'm now having here only two w's. I'm only having a w1 into w2, okay? And I randomly initialize it, for example, right here. So this might be my initial starting point for my weights, okay? Now, what is the gradient? It's the one where I'm minimizing, uh, maximizing the function. So this is the minimum. So my gradient will point me outward, and it will point me in a right angle to the isolines. Okay, the isolines are the lines where my function is constant. Um, so it's pointing me outward, and I will do a single step in this direction. Now for batch gradient descent, how expensive is it to calculate this gradient? I have to iterate over all training examples to calculate it, right? And iterating over 68,000 training examples for MLIS, for example, that's doable, but it is expensive. Okay, so it takes one step, takes 68,000 steps. So this is the number of MNIST, I think approximately of the MNIST training digits. Okay, I did my update, and I'm doing it again, and again, and again, and again, and always following the gradient, okay? Great. And so for each of these steps, cost me 68,000. So here comes the alternative. Let's take another, um, algorithm, the stochastic gradient descent, and that takes only one training example, but a randomly selected, and then calculates the gradient. And of course, the estimation is kind of crappy, right? It's slightly wrong, because this is a big average of all training example, and this is one. And here would be another one, and here's another one, and here's another one, and maybe here's another one, and there, and there, and those. So if I take different training points, so it can point in all directions. But overall, yeah, 
I'm kind of more likely to get something which is reasonable because the average of all these gradients for a single data point will average to the true one. Okay, let's say I'm, I've taken Z1. Okay, great, I'm going one step over there. But this cost me only one euro. This thing cost me 68,000 euros, okay? And then I'm doing the same thing again. And maybe um, next time I'm picking that one and I'm doing that one. And so I'm kind of going like this. Maybe I'm also going towards the wrong direction. But maybe after 100 points, I'm, I'm reached the minimum, okay? And here, after 100 steps, I'm not even finished my first gradient calculation. Okay, that's why stochastic gradient is much more superior than the batch gradient method. So the gradient method or gradient descent, descent going downhill, gradient, we use the gradient, and the stochasticity here is by selecting a randomly selected input. So that's the stochastic part of it. Batch, we have a batch of data points, so that's where the batch gradient word comes from, and I'm calculating it over the whole batch. Of course now, there are compromises, right? I mean, the extreme thing is I'm taking a single data point and follow it. I could also say, okay, then don't take a batch of 68,000, take a batch of 10 data points, right, and average those. And that might be a better idea, yeah? So, depends on your GPU. So how do you choose the batch size? You choose it by looking at your GPU. So how many computations can I do in parallel? Because I want to do in parallel for as many data points as possible, calculate the gradient and average it, and then use that step. But I don't want to have two clock cycles for that one. I want to use a single clock cycle and want to calculate as many gradients as possible with my GPU. That's like a trade-off between these things. Okay, so far so good. So this is the difference between batch gradient and stochastic gradient. And there's more to say about it. The stochastic gradient descent now sounds like, okay, that's a really nice choice, right? So for computational efficiency. But as it turns out, it also adds noise to the op optimization process. It might be part of the reason that deep learning is working so well, okay? So in deep learning, it's super surprising if you would go, uh, I don't know, 30 years ago to the statistics department and say, yeah, here's a new model. Uh, we don't have the computers yet, but in 30 years we will have. And my model has 30 billion parameters. Then the statistician would ask, so how many data points do you have? Uh, like 50 million or something. And then he, he or she would have laughed at you, right? And said, this is not possible. You cannot optimize 50 billion parameters at all. You never will be able to do this. But surprisingly, in deep learning, you can. And um, there is no real theory yet why it works so well. So that is your job for the next 30 years, maybe, to find out why deep learning is working so well. But part of the answer is that stochastic gradient is doing something random here. And by that kind of regularizing the solution implicitly. There are some really interesting things to find out. Okay, um, here's some historical stuff. So there's this guy called um, Frank Rosenblatt, 1962. And he did something very similar to what we've seen. So we have the more clean formulation as linear regression. Here's something very similar. So here's some activation or some, some uh, they could, were also called activation functions, but let's call those our basis functions. So he's chosen some basis functions. He's from the double E department, I think from the West Coast, no, from the East Coast. And he looks exactly at that one where you have a sign, basically as a nonlinearity. And then he says, so this is a nice model for a neuron. Let's solder it with wires and let's train it on some real data, okay? And i show you a picture. So this on the left-hand side is Frank Rosenblatt. I hope I'm not violating any copyrights here in my YouTube video, but let's see what's happening. Okay, and there's another one, um, Charles Whiteman. So I don't know about him before this picture, but like Frank Rosenblatt, he's, I, did, I think he must be as old as you are now, right? But he's wearing a tie. That's just how people look 50 years ago, okay? So I, I also not wearing a tie in the suit anymore. But um, so he's just a student there and, and maybe working on his master or PhD project. And he's doing something super innovative here. And he, he built another one. So this is the Mark I perceptron. So a lot of soldering, a lot of things doing this. And he's from the double E department. So I think he's from electrical engineering. 
Um, so in detail, there are little differences to our model, but it is very similar. Uh, basically, the model that we looked at is basically coming from his model and chewing on it and modifying it a little bit. He basically uses targets with minus one and plus one, and that's like very clever because then he can have a very nice loss function here. Where I'm not going too much into the detail, only the summation is only going over the wrongly classified examples. Okay, and if they are wrongly classified, then basically the first term here might be positive and the last term here is negative. So the product is negative and then with the minus sign we get something positive. So it's something reasonable to minimize. Okay, and it turns out that this works also very well. There's a similar one um, from the West Coast, from Vidro and Hopf. So Vidro is, I think, a Stanford professor, um, also from electrical engineering, and as often in the US, like the same ideas are on the East Coast and on the West Coast, and, but slightly different, right? In these times, they didn't have the internet or the DARPA net at that point. They needed to write letters and read written papers and stuff like that to exchange ideas. So it happens that the ideas are around. Maybe they attended the same conference. They had the same intuitions. And one says, let's try it like this. And the other said, let's try it like that. And so the same idea can pop up at different locations. And I'm sure in Russia, there must have been some researchers as well, and maybe in China too, and in some other countries as well who did it. OK. And they called it ADA lines, calling adaptive linear element, which is, yeah, this is a linear element we are looking at. This is very linear. OK, so here are some historic pictures. Um, of course, now there's the AI logic people, right? The logical AI people. And they're asking, what are the mathematical limits of this device? We believe in theory improving, so let's try to find the bug. And so here's a picture from a book called Perceptrons by Marvin Minsky and Simon Peppard. I think Simon Peppard is a behavioral psychologist working together with some computer scientist, Marvin Minsky, which you might know, who's like also like a big AI person, but from the classical AI world. And this book is from 1960, uh, 1969 from MIT Press. So that is um, interesting, so like publishing venue where people write out ideas. And they are basically pointing out limitations of the perceptron idea, problems that can't be solved, okay? So, and I think it can solve the XOR problem when you have the appropriate choice of the basis function, so that's not a problem. However, when you limit the so-called receptive field of a single basis function, yeah, then certain connectivity problems cannot be solved. And that is pointed out mathematically very precise in this book, Perceptron, from Minsky and Peppert. Um, with receptive fields, it is meant, so this might be basis function number one, phi one, and it's looking at these input signals here. So this is like a retina yeah, in your eye, and there are like wires connected to it that then do some computation to compute something. And this is a drawing from this book. And so if this is limited and not spreading over the whole eye, yeah, then there are certain connectivity problems that you cannot solve. And um, yeah, I have an example. So also here your brain needs to be fast, so let me show you a picture. So did you see the tiger? It's very hard to see, right? So you really have to look around and to understand. And maybe if you look longer, maybe you understand the scene and you can see something. But we are also not perfect, so we can also not solve all the problems. In particular, our neurons that are connected to the retina, they also have a restricted receptive field. So the, in, in V1 and V2, so again, sorry, this is party knowledge, but there are these visual cortex thing, area called V1 and V2, and they are connected to your eyes. By the way, they are crossing each other. This is nice party knowledge. And they are not, the neurons are not connected to the full retina, but only to local parts. And by that, they are combining things. So we have the same problem as the perceptron, basically, with our vision system. Anyway, this is a problem that can't be solved. So this is a connection problem, OK? So the question is, which has two red lines and which has a single red line, OK? And that's it. So now, please answer the question, the top one or the bottom one. Which was just a single red line and which was the two red lines? It is made in such a way if you only look at the square here, yeah, you cannot decide, right? And no matter whether I have the center square, it looks the same as the other center square, but by 90 degrees. So for deciding, 
the connectivity problem, I need to have an overview of the whole picture. And then I could write down a formula with mathematics, for example, and saying, OK, this pixel is connected to Z1, and I can like have a chain, and I can define it mathematically. But you can't do it with the perceptron of Rosenblatt. OK? And so the whole book is on this topic, that the perceptron is limited in what it can do. OK? Which is quite interesting. Now you could say, oh, were well, they so nasty, right? Didn't they want to destroy it? No, they were just convinced that logical AI is the right approach, and that should be pursued, and not the electrical engineering soldering something. So this is a dead end, right? Because there are really limitations, but the mathematical approach to AI is, as doesn't have limitations. So we should pursue that one. So in a way, it's also like um, competing with maybe funding and other things, or competing with attention and these kind of things. But I, I guess so they are not bad people. They are super, super great, famous scientists. And they were just convinced perceptrons is the wrong idea. You shouldn't follow it, OK? And so perceptrons, they had their winter then at some point. There's also a sad story. So I think Frank Rosenblatt died in some accident. And then basically, that kind of research was dead, right? Because he was like the person pursuing it. And so there are these kind of stories. But then in the 80s, um, they, were, they were again regaining back propagation rule was understood better, maybe or reinvented also as Jürgen Schmidhuber, you ask Jürgen Schmidhuber, you would say it was reinvented by um, certain uh, researchers, but maybe made to work on really practical problems in the 80s. And then the neural networks again, they rise again and were successful again. Then came the kernel machines and the neural networks went down again, like at the end of the 90s. And then came AlexNet solving the ImageNet problem in 2010. And now neural networks are again on the rise. And they are still on the rise. We never know what will be the next big topic. Okay. Anyway, so this is like a bit history thing. So I still haven't figured out, even it's now that long on the slide, I couldn't figure it out. So let's, let's do it once. So let me follow this line here. So that is this one. OK, the top one is two lines, and the bottom one is a single line. OK, you can check at home whether this is true. OK, so far so good. I can't, only if I really go with my fingers along the whole thing. But going with my finger along the red thing is not something about visual cortex v1, v2, and some simple processing thing. So this is really deep in my brain happening. OK. So how can we generalize single layer neural networks now? How can we make them more powerful? Let's make our basis functions adaptive as well. Let's plug in there another single layer network. OK, so that's now the next step, going to the multi-layer network. Um, mathematically, it just looks like this. So this was a single layer computation. So bias term plus some matrix times x. And then some nonlinearity. Another popular one is the tangent superbolicus. Yeah, for whatever reasons. Um, maybe because it looks like the, um, I can show you the reason. The tangent superbolicus looks like this. So that is the tangent superbolicus. And it will converge against minus 1. So it just it looks like the sigmoid function, but now it goes through 0. So it's kind of more symmetric. Right. So this one, the zero is kind of funny, right? So what does it mean to output a zero? It's like biologically plausible to either have some new signal going out or have nothing going out. However, computationally, it's nicer to be symmetric about the zero. That's why we take the tangent superbolicus. Surprisingly, it also has some nice formula. Um, it looks like this. I think it's e to the a minus something like something like this approximately, or the other way around. And we will use it in a second to calculate derivatives. Um, OK, I can also have two hidden layers. By now, um, after having the tangent superbolicus and another linear layer, I could have another tangent superbolicus and another linear layer. And by now, these nonlinearities are essential, right? Why? Suppose there is no tangent superbolicus in here, and there is no tangent superbolicus in here then all the matrices would just collapse into one big linear function. So the reason why this is an interesting function is because of these nonlinearities in here. 
There's another detail I need to tell you. So um, now, how is the tangent hyperbolicus applied to b plus w x? The thing is, it is a, a, a vector that comes out, right? So the let's say the x is from r to the two, and then we have the w transpose x plus b. So that that is a scalar. But if I put here a whole matrix in here, right? Then that is a vector as well. So that might be r to the 100, if I have like 100 units in the first layer. And then the tangent superbolicus applied to that one is applied component-wise. OK? So with other words, the tangent superbolicus of a vector v1 to vd is defined to be the vector tangent superbolicus applied to v1 and tangent superbolicus applied to vd. OK, so component-wise. I think there might be an exercise where you need to show what's happening if you remove the activation functions. And then everything will collapse into a big linear mapping. So that's another reason why it's a good idea to have nonlinearities in here. So here are candidates for activation functions. Um, so this is the sigmoid. We've seen that one. And it can be motivated by log logistic discriminant analysis, right? Assuming we have two Gaussian distributions. Then there's one which is good looking, right? But that's, for me, the motivation, it's good looking. It looks like the sigmoid, but has nicer properties. And it has also nice properties when you calculate derivatives of, as I show in a second, right? E functions, that's already suspicious, right? Taking the derivative of an E function is the E function. And it turns out taking the derivative of the tangent superbolicus is 1 minus the tangent superbolicus squared, which is nice. Here's another one. That's the most popular one. It's also an older one, but that is the one that was super successful like 2010 in these AlexNet and these ones. It's the ReLU. And the ReLU um, is the rectifying linear unit or something. So it's a linear function, right? It's just constant. And on the negative part, it's 0. Okay? And to really appreciate it, let's draw it into our picture here. So it's really this function, which is constant 0. And then it's going like that. And I think this is the simplest possible nonlinearity. Yeah? Don't quote me on that one, but I, I couldn't think of a simpler nonlinearity. Right? So this is really super simple. I mean, it's linear on one side and 0 on the other side. So there's one little thing here that is wrong. But it's surprisingly, that one works very well for classification problems. So that was the basis. I think it was in these early networks for ImageNet. And um, also, when you plug these activation functions between the linear layers, you cannot collapse the, the, the matrices on top of each other. So you get something useful and something interesting. Um, Important is they must be nonlinear. If you don't make them nonlinear, everything collapses and the whole function is boring. Okay? And they are always component wise functions. Yeah? They are always programmed like if you apply to a vector, it's like applying to each component. Okay, so let's see how we can implement this. So here's an implementation in Python, and it's just copying the mathematical formula into code. Okay? So we give the input layer a fancy name and call it Z1. And then we say the second layer is the output of some tangent superbolicus, blah, blah, blah. And we call it Z2. And then the third layer might be Z3. And finally, we have some output layer where we omit the nonlinearity. Depending on what you want, you could also leave it there. However, then you are between minus 1 and plus 1. But possibly, you also want to have larger function values. And then you don't put it there. Then now part of the so-called forward computation is not only the output of my neural network, but let's put some more steps here. Let's calculate the error as well, because that's what we actually want to minimize at the end, right? So y minus the targets, and then I'm having the targets transpose times the error, so which is basically the Frobenius norm or the um, norm, the, the no, product norm of the R, OK? And that is then the squared error. So that is my forward computation. So far, so good. Let's calculate the derivatives. And I, again, try to do it with the differentials. Um, 
the names here that I put here are also now used in the following derivation. So they are like nice and easy because I can calculate the differential z3, yeah? And then I can plug in an expression for z3 and go on with my computation. So let's see how this goes. So I start with minimizing my error. That's the one that I want to minimize. And I want to have the derivative with respect to the weights and the biases. OK? So let's plug it in. So it's 1 half r transpose times r. And I can then drag the d in. And so people are looking already onto the watch, so it's already a quarter to 12. The question is maybe whether your brains are already filled with enough symbols for today. Um, let me think. Yeah, maybe let's continue at this point here next time, OK? I'll just give you a quick preview of what will come. So we will calculate the derivative. We will find out that um, we can very cleverly calculate the derivative of the tangent superbolicus by using some intermediate result from the forward computation, but we go into greater detail next time. And here's a computation for your pleasure of the derivative of the tangent superbolicus. OK, so this can be computed. And I always appreciate students going through this, because then the bugs can be removed. So this is a new slide, so it wasn't in the old one. So it might be still a bit bug-ridden. And then here's the implementation of the backward computation, and so on and so forth. And then we go into greater detail. So, but that's enough for today. So we reach the forward computation. And next time, I show you how to calculate the derivatives in a clever way so that we can efficiently compute it. OK, that's it for today. Thanks for your attention, and I see you on Wednesday.